we're on. Professor Brian Wolf, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for, for joining me today on my podcast that I, that I do here at Gilman School. Um, for people who are watching Professor Wolf, I, I first met you this past summer at Middlebury's Breadloaf School of English, and uh, you were nice enough to allow me to take your Humbugs and Visionaries course which I had an awesome experience in, and I learned a lot about art history, the history of early America before the Civil War. Um, some of the figures that we read and discussed include Emerson and Edgar Allan Poe and Benjamin Franklin, uh, Frederick Douglass. So we, we really got through a lot. It was one of my favorite classes that I've ever taken. And, um, and I appreciate you, and I appreciate you coming, coming today to, uh, to discuss some paintings. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. It's an honor to be here, uh, and I'm delighted to have a chance to just talk with you. Me too. Thank you very much. Um, for people who are watching, Professor, would you mind saying a few words about uh, just your interest in art and where that started, and maybe a little bit about your, your background so people know who you are? Okay. Uh, let's see. So I started, let me go way back for a moment just to get a contrast. I I grew up in the 50s, and that's when Russia launched the Sputnik uh, satellite, and everybody in this country, in panicked response, was urged to become a scientist if you were studying in school. So I actually started out uh, in chemistry uh, in college. Uh, I went to Rice University in Houston, but I took a freshman English class, and it was a conversion experience. Hmm. I loved looking at text and doing a deep dive, close readings, and really getting into the nuances and complications. And that was it, I was converted. Uh, I became an English major. Uh, I went to actually the Yale Divinity School because I was actually very interested in theology and philosophy. Uh, then went into the American Studies program, got my PhD, taught at Yale for many, many years. At a certain point said, you know, I love California. There's an opportunity to teach at Stanford. I think I'll take advantage of it. Went to Stanford, retired from there, came back to the East Coast. And now, though I'm retired, I find I need to have my fingers in the game. I love teaching and teaching at Breadloaf in the summer is the perfect way to do that. Love it. That's awesome. Well, I'm curious about that first English class you took. What was that all about? What was so special about that? It was an introduction to literature. Uh, and it was just, it, it began with short stories and then uh, moved to novels. Uh, but it's the first time I'd ever had a class that really looked closely and understood the complications that, of, that literature gives you in its vision of the world and of life and of irony. And um, and it was just an eye opener. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't get enough of it. Yeah, it reminds me of my, my first English class that I took in college that really sold me on the English major too was with Philip Fisher. And, Phil uh, Fisher. Phil yes. Fisher. Okay. <laughs> and he was amazing. And, uh, you know, there was a guy on my lacrosse team in college named Jake, too. And I've always loved English. I've loved reading and writing. But Jake was a senior. I was a freshman. I didn't really know what I was what I was doing at all. And he was like, you got to come to Philip Fisher's English class lecture style. <laughs> and I was sold immediately after that as well. Yeah, I mean, Phil is a major, aside from being a wonderful, wonderful teacher, is a major scholar of American literature. So you got in, you fell in with the right company there. I think so. I think so. And I fell in with the right company with your class this past summer, too, called Humbugs and Visionaries. And that's a class that you've worked on for a while, right? Humbugs and Visionaries. Yes, yes. It's, uh, it started when I came back to Yale to teach P.T. Barnum, Mr. Humbug, the guy who really had that title. Um, used to operate out of Bridgeport, Connecticut. So a 20 minute drive or train ride from New Haven where I was teaching. Um, and I would take the class uh, to Barnum's Museum which still exists there. Um, but unfortunately in a very Barnum-esque moment it got struck by lightning uh, a, a few years back. Wow. And it's still closed while they're repairing it. But that's where the title came from. That was the humbugs. And the visionaries, you know, were Emerson, Dickinson, Melville, all those wonderful people. Hmm. 
What exactly is a humbug for people who don't know? Because that's the first thing you see on the course catalog is, is humbug. That's what I saw. And I understood a little bit about, okay, I understand what a visionary is. I know that I'm going to be taking a, a course that's, you know, about early America and painting and art and history. But the humbug title, what, what exactly does that mean in your view? Uh, I, I think of the humbug, I guess the modern version of a humbug would be gaslighting. It's somebody who sells you on the appearance of something, mm -hmm. uh, but there's no substance behind it. Uh, and uh, it's just, um, it's a sham. Mm -hmm. uh, but not just a sham in, in some little way, it, it's really a, somebody who's a trickster mm -hmm. uh, and is really playing mind games with you. And Barnum perfected that. He turned that into a profession. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. Yeah, I loved that class this summer. And I really, I really loved learning about some of the visionaries too, like Emerson. I'm actually uh, reading some of Emerson today in my English class. I'm taking yeah, some, of the, some of the things you taught this summer, <laughs> um, as well as Walden Pond. We're going to read some of Walden by Thoreau. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my, my sense is, has always been, if you want to see, if Emerson were walking by, he would be looking up into the sky and his head would be lost in the clouds there. And that would be Emerson's vision of how you proceed through life. But if Thoreau were walking by, he would be looking down and he would be examining every pebble and every stone and everything because his vision of how you get to the infinite is through the finite, through the everyday and the ordinary. Hmm, interesting. I um I'm I'm excited to read the passage in Emerson about the transparent eyeball, which I learned oh, about yes. with you this summer. Um, oh, that'll be wonderful. I'll read a little bit of it now, if that's okay, and then and sure. then if you can add some input, that would be that would be awesome. Um, okay. <laughs> so Emerson says, um, in nature. There I feel nothing can befall me in life, no disgrace, no calamity, which nature cannot repair. Standing on bare ground, my head bathed in the blithe air and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circulate through me. I am part or particle of God. The name of the nearest friend sounds then foreign and accidental. To be brothers, to be acquaintances, master or ser servant, is then a trifle and a disturbance. I am the lover of uncontained and immortal beauty. In the wilderness, I find something more dear and connate than in streets or villages. In the tranquil landscape, and especially in the distant line of the horizon, man beholds somewhat as beautiful as his own nature. Right. Wow. I, that's to me that that's just such beautiful, complicated prose. Uh, and I would probably begin with uh, standing on the bare ground. Uh, and because we normally think of Emerson as this great lover of nature and the title of the essay is nature. But what's interesting is that this experience of really becoming one with the cosmos of becoming a transparent eyeball only begins by a process of standing on bare ground. It's not like I'm surrounded by trees and the sounds of the woods. It's the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's like he needs to, to sort of remove uh, uh, any actual nature outside himself, mm -hmm. the bare ground, in order to come into contact with a deeper sort of nature that is inside himself. Uh, and it seems to me that's when, and it's really, for me, it's really a passage about self-empowerment. That's when the power flows in, when you come into contact with the sort of the deepest forces of the universe, which circulate through you. Mm -hmm. uh, and the final thing I would just add to that is, and they don't just come in in some mystical ah sort of way, he becomes an eyeball. Uh, he could have said, I am one with the world, but he doesn't say that because it's all about the individual's ability to see in a visionary way. And it's really transforming yourself into a visionary by listening to that inner voice and that power uh, that we all harbor 
within. So one of the things I, I think about when I read that passage is meditation today. And, you know, meditation is so in vogue and a lot of people talk about it because we live in such a crazy world with cell phones and we're always on and, you know, we're shooting out emails and we're responding to things <laughs> in 24 hours or it's late. And when he says transparent eyeball, I, I really think of meditation because in the practice of meditation, you're turning off all exterior inputs and stimulus and you're just really knowing yourself and studying your own mind absolutely and he says there you know th 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 towards the end of that passage that you were reading when the name of how how is that the name of a dearest neighbor to me is how, how does that uh, sentence go um uh the name of the d nearest friend sounds then foreign and accidental to be brothers to be acquaintances master or servant is then a trifle and a disturbance Exactly. You have to move outside the social world. This won't happen when you're surrounded by emails and friends or whatever Emerson was surrounded by. Uh, it's when you're alone with yourself. And to use some of Emerson's language, it's, it's, it's there that you discover the God within. Mm -hmm. And now when he uses the word God in this uh, passage, how do you read that? Do you, that's not a, uh, typical reference to this, you know, spiritual Christian God. It, it's something else. Uh, yes, I would come down heavily on the something else. Uh, I, I think it's um, it, it is simply. I, I don't even know how how one begins to describe it. So it, it, it is the power of being itself, of being in the world, uh, of a sense of a world whose it, it, it's like it. Let's put it this way. It's the sacred in the everyday, mm -hmm. the way there is nothing, no detail in life that can't just erupt with a sense of the divine, uh, of, of a sort of sacred quality. So it's not God in a sort of traditional Judaic or Christian sort of um, there's a God up there, there's a heaven, and so on. It's the God in everyday moments of living. That's what he's after. Now, I'm curious how um, these transcendentalists, how they c came to rebel against typical <laughs> Christianity, because Emerson was a minister, right? I mean, he was trained yeah. in ministry, and then it seems like all of a sudden he took this radical, for the time, a radical approach to to um, spiritualism and in reality in the same way. How did he, like, what, what, what compelled him to take this? radical approach? What do you think it was? Uh, that's a really good, good question. And there was one incident in Emerson's life. So he's trained as a Unitarian minister. And he goes to uh, the Harvard Divinity School. He's in Boston. He's, you know, Harvard isn't in his family line. He comes from generations of what at that point were congregational ministers, and then they became Unitarians. Um, and uh, he said he was in church one day and he said in the Unitarian church and he was at, at um, looking out the window and he said, I looked out, I was in the church room and it was cold and dead and I looked out the window and it was alive and filled with energy. Uh, and he called it corpse cold Unitarianism. Hmm. So his break, I think, was to break out of all doctrine uh, and all traditional formulations of religion for something that to him felt inward experiential, something you feel with your body mm -hmm. uh, as much as with your mind. Uh, and in that way, it was deeply romantic. Um, and, uh, and the transcendentalists, you know, their very title, transcendentalism, did not come from them. That was not their own label for themselves. It was later on, someone very critical of them said, oh, oh the, the old transcendentalist, you know, they, they, because it was going back to German philosophy and Immanuel Kant who used terms like that. Hmm. So it was a smear, actually. Would it, but it was a smear that worked. Did right? they have a, did the transcendentalists themselves, like Emerson, Thoreau, uh, Walt Whitman, did they have titles for them themselves that they called themselves? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. 
They were probably uh, they were probably against all titles in the first place. I think so. I think you put your finger on it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I've I've loved returning to these writers and learning a little bit more about their experience directly with nature um, and what really drove their thinking. And I'm also curious a little bit about where this, what they read, you know, like it wouldn't be interesting to understand what Emerson and Thoreau read to inspire this outlook on life. They were reading uh, the British romantics because remember in their one generation behind Wordsworth is writing from the 17, mid to 1790s, then way into the, er, into the early 1800s. Emerson doesn't publish Nature till 1836. So there's this full generation lag and they're going back to, to uh, especially Coleridge and Carlyle. And Carlyle's the big figure there actually. Emerson goes to Europe. He travels to Europe at one point and his goal is I want to meet Coleridge. I want to meet Carlyle. Uh, and he does, and in classic Emersonian fashion, he writes in his diary afterwards, very disappointing. Really? He thought, yes, because he thought that as individuals, they were merely individuals. They were just people you could meet on the street. It was in the writing that mm. they achieved greatness. Hmm. That's fascinating. Wow. Um, what do you think uh, Emerson would think of the world today? <laughs> Whoa, complicated question. Uh, I I think Emerson would okay, let let's let's divide it into two answers. Let's let's make it an either or sort of thing. Well, my first uh, thought would be that he would be he would be very dismayed by technology and the phones and social media and constant communication, right? I mean, that would be my the so. obvious answer to me. Right, yes. He would feel that these are all distractions from one's true self, from just listening to who you are, which gets back to what you were saying about meditation. I mean, and why that's an interesting analogy uh, for an Emersonian worldview. Um, the other side that I think would encourage Emerson would be the sense of, actually it would be the sense of popular discontent. The very fact that there is protest in the world, uh, the very fact that there are people whose voices are, people insisting that their voice be heard would for Emerson, I think, be a sign that there's hope. Hmm. Interesting, yeah. Well, um, I think a lot of that question reminds me about Thomas Cole and uh, and a little bit about his outlook on life during the Jacksonian era because sure. of the, I guess, the new world that was opening up in America. And, and maybe it would be okay if we, we looked at the Oxbow first today. I know, okay. I know I had the um, Watson and the Shark first because I saw this yesterday at the National Gallery, but... Why don't we look at the oxbow first? And I can't see you anymore, but I think I, okay. I can still hear you. I think you're much better off looking at Thomas Cole's painting. Rather than <laughs> on the I was blown away yesterday at the National Gallery looking at not this painting, but um, but his work in general, because it's yeah. so intricate and way larger than I expected. Right, right. Uh Yes. Well, you know, when so the Oxbow, let's just begin with the fact, you know, it, it, it's painted in 1836. And 1836 is the last year of Andrew Jackson's presidency. It's when Jacksonian American is sort of rushing forward, basically. Uh, it's the year that the Cherokees are expelled and uh, the year of the Trail of Tears as they head to and die on the way to Oklahoma. Uh, and it's also the year of the Battle of the Alamo. And this is all about land expansion, manifest destiny, though the term hasn't been coined yet, uh, in 19th century America. And so what Thomas Cole is giving in this painting here, it seems to me, is a sort of, it's a meditation on land and a, a nation that identifies itself with its landscape. What they used to say in the 19th century was, Europeans have history, and it's not a particularly happy one. 
But Americans have nature and nature is fresh. It's the American Adam. We have a fresh start here. So Cole is looking at the landscape as the embodiment of the nation and he's dividing it into two parts. On the left, what we see is wilderness, basically, a world of uh, wildness, blasted trees, uh, rich, deep, dense vegetation, and storm clouds. And on the right, what we see is cultivation and a pastoral landscape, America as it wishes to see itself. But you'll notice if you look straight back to the center at that hill that has uh, what is in fact some clear cutting going on, it's a sort of warning that what Cole is saying, and, and then actually, uh, let me see, I don't think I can point this out, but if you wanna know where there is a picture, a self-portrait of Cole himself there. So if you find that umbrella uh, that bridges the oxbow, which is an actual formation in the Connecticut River, this is a real location, um, the painter Thomas Cole is a little to its left and he's looking out to us, to the viewer, as if to say, you have a choice. You can preserve the wilderness on the left or you can create this sort of civilized pastoral landscape on the right, but when you do, you will lose wildness. Uh, and so caution about what sort of future you wish to create for yourself. Um, and it's been pointed out by critics that when you look at the shape of the oxbow, the Connecticut River at that point in Massachusetts, uh, what you get is a question mark, as if this is the question about where we will go uh, in our future. Interesting, yeah. And they call the, the left side of the painting, right, the sublime. It's the right. it's nature in its rawest form. And then you've got the, uh, the blasted tree, which is in most of Cole's paintings, right? Absolutely. That's, that's right. That's right. Um, and if, uh, I don't know if you have kindred spirits there because it becomes, a, after Cole's death, it becomes a symbol of Cole himself. I do have kindred uh, spirits. Um, and I also, I think I zoom in a little bit here on yeah, the blasted tree. Right. Tom, why did Thomas Cole do this purposely in pretty much all of his paintings, this, this blasted tree in the foreground? Right, right. It's a good question. Um, I think part of it uh, was uh, he had a sort of, a, a sort of binary imagination. His, his world was always defined by oppositions. Uh, and so if you had something pastoral on one side, you would always have something that was its opposite. And I think he finally had a very tragic view of life, uh, that those blasted trees, of his, one of his earliest versions, uh, is it takes the shape of Adam and Eve being expelled from the Garden of Eden. They're almost anthropomorphic. Mm -hmm. And this painting of the expulsion, uh, the figures of Adam and Eve mirror those figures of a blasted tree. And finally, it was also an image of, again, sort of, we damage what we touch, that uh, in trying to inhabit this world, we alter it and it's not for the best. We blast our trees. Hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. And then I have, yeah, you don't see Cole as the artist. He's right next to this, but you see you some go. of the, uh, um, the cultivated land to the right of the oxbow. Exactly. Exactly. And you see, you know, cultivation means it's an emptied landscape and it has its own pastoral charms, but it's at the expense of wildness. And in that way, I would link Cole with Emerson. Emerson likes the wildness in the soul. Uh, and I think Cole deeply regrets its loss. Hmm. And then I was reading about the Oxbow a little bit before our conversation, and, and um, I read something that in the mountain in the background or the hill in the background, it's there, that's a, a message in the, in the mountain. You can faintly see it here. Yes, 
Well, there's been some controversy over whether that's just a random sort of clear cutting going on. You see it in the upper left corner of your detail. Or whether it actually, uh, people have said it, it resembles Hebrew, and it's the Hebrew for Noah, which is the Hebrew version of Noah and the flood. Hmm. So that if that's true, if that is a proper interpretation, then it's the sense of a, a sort of natural disaster brought on by mankind himself. Hmm. Yeah, when I look at this picture, this painting today, I think about on the left, if this painting was painted today, on the left, you might have society before technology or before phones and people <laughs> interacting and talking to each other. And, you know, if you go on any public transportation today, everyone's head is, is down in their phone, which has a lot of advantages, right? You can connect to people and talk to people in an instant and this would be maybe photographed on the right of the of the oxbow but you are missing some of the personal connection that i think is valuable in the sublime on the left absolutely i agree i agree entirely uh let's go to uh kindred spirits here i think this is an oh there he is ah good hello mr cole right (laughs) there he is all right. Uh, oh, this is the other one that I saw. We we can maybe skip this one. Okay. And we'll go. To, I love these. I love these series of Voyage of Life, right. though. The Voyage of Life one, right? All right. Here we go with Kindred Spirits. Kindred Spirits. So Thomas Cole dies prematurely in 1848. Uh, he was born in, I believe, it's 1801, 1802, something like that. So he's he's just in his 40s. Um, And this is a memorial portrait to Cole done the year after his death in 1849. Um, And we know in part it's a tribute to Cole because in the lower left foreground, you'll see that blasted tree, that sort of Cole motif. Only here the tree is really split in half because it's an actual allusion to Cole who actually died uh, with only half his life lived. Um, And the two figures on the rock outcropping there are Thomas Cole, the figure on the right, who's got his mall stick that he used, you know, when your paint you use to steady your hand, his mall stick pointing out into the wilderness. Uh, and next to him is uh, William Cullen Bryant, who's the first poet, romantic poet of American nature. And so the title, Kindred Spirits, refers one to Cole and Bryant as painting and poetry. And those were called the sister arts. They are kindred spirits, painting and poetry. But at a larger level, the kindred spirits are the human figures in relation to nature, because we are kindred with nature. And look at all the angles. Look at the way the rock outcropping they're standing on is an angle pointing us back. Look at the way uh, the tree limb on the far right corner, or again, the rock outcropping on the right side, all are vectors or angles that point you back into the landscape. Because the goal of the painting is to carry the viewer into a world where you will experience the power of nature, a, a moment of epiphany, of revelation, when the power of sort of God's presence in the landscape uh, is experienced by the individual uh, when it becomes our power, which I think in part is why the two figures on the landscape there are not at the center of the painting, but are pushed a bit to the side because it's asking us to voyage. They are pointing us, the viewer, into that world and saying, "We we can't do it for you. This is an experience you must have yourself, and it's available if you just go out into nature hmm. and, and sort of absorb its power. Um, so it's an invitation to a certain sort of conversion again, but a conversion that nature uh, provides, and it's a conversion into the discovery of your own inner power in and through the landscape. So even though Duran painted this for Thomas Cole, right, because of his premature death as an ode to him, correct? Right. 
Right. Uh, he's almost pushing back on Cole's Oxbow in that the Oxbow is saying there's one choice or the other. You either have the raw sublime of nature or you have the agrarian uh, controlled type of environment. This one says right. this right. painting says no man and nature can live uh, uh, symbiotically with each other or, or absolutely kindredly. That's right. That's right. And, you know, we could add, uh, I, I know actually we talked about this for a moment last summer, we could add a gender dimension here. Notice it's only guys on a day out mm -hmm. in nature. And in part, what I understand this to mean is uh, there is a sort of conflict in Duran's mind, the painter's mind, over the question of who controls culture. Who controls the spiritual values of the nation? Who are our spiritual priests and instructors? Uh, and it's an effort to say you don't find that at home, which is the woman's sphere. You find it out in the woods, which becomes the man's sphere. So I think it's an effort by artists in a commercial world uh, where culture has been relegated to the realm of the home and women to reclaim culture and to say we've got a rugged vi vision of sort of uh, spiritual value that comes right out of nature uh, and it, this is a this is in, it's a sort of male centric vision of how culture operates. Now is this a pretty large? I, I imagine this is a pretty large canvas and canvas in person uh it, it's big but it's it's not like some of those coals it's not sort of wall size hmm. in that way and where is kindred spirits is it in new york uh it used to be in new york uh and then uh the walmart family uh the waltons right. uh bought it and brought it to arkansas uh where is it crystal bridges right now have you seen this in person i'm sure you have yes yeah. i have I have. Wow. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's see what else we have here. Oh, I've got a zoomed in. There we go. There are two guys, Cole and Bryant. Okay. Um, <laughs> what do you think makes sense? Should we go to to this image? Sure. All right. Let's sure. talk about this one. Yeah. This is so. This is uh, this is called War News from Mexico. Uh. And it's uh, 1848, 1849. It's during uh, the Mexican War of that period, uh, when it's a territorial war again, all about land between the United States and Mexico. Um, and it was the first war fought after the telegraph had been invented. So instead of waiting weeks to find out what happened somewhere far away, you could get almost instant accounts of what was going on. Uh, and that's what's happening in this picture. Uh, you have here uh, a, a sort of series of men, and notice how it's arranged. You've got men there at the center, and above it, you have a sign that says the American Hotel which lets you know this isn't just a random group of people. These are representatives of the nation itself. And then you have to the right, looking out a window, a woman, because she is politically disenfranchised. She's not part of the public sphere that the men are, but she's at their level because she's also white. Hmm. And not at their level are the two black figures in the foreground who sit there listening, but you don't know what they're understanding. Because what we know is what this war is really about is not just land, but the expansion of slavery uh, to Texas, uh, sort of heading west. Mm -hmm. So much is at stake here. Uh, and what I find particularly interesting, Jake, do you have a, de a, a detail of the feet? You don't have that, do you? I don't, unfortunately. Okay. So look at the clothing of the figures. You've got a central figure who's gotten a newspaper that is the extra. It's the sort of the penny press, the sort of daily newspapers of the period. 
through the power of the telegraph, now have all these headlines. They've turned the war into a sensation. They're putting out special editions, extra, extra, read all about it. And he's reading it to this community who are in, in you know, engrossed in the news. But uh, there is a man there with the top hat and look what he's wearing. He's not wearing pants in the modern dress sense. He's got knee breeches on, which carries him back one generation to the American Revolution. And next to him is this mysterious figure with dark glasses whispering into his ear and pointing back to the newspaper. So you have to imagine that what's really happening is that the figure who is whispering and reaching back to the paper is trying to say to a figure, to an old man who is dressed as if he comes from the era of the American Revolution. He's trying to say the American Revolution and the values you represented are being extended and continued here as he points back to the newspaper in this modern war. In other words, he's trying to justify, legitimate the war by saying the War of 1848 with Mexico is really an extension of uh, the uh, American Revolution and the values that it represented. Hmm. But the key to me, the most ironic moment in it, are the shoes of the revolutionary figure, the figure reading, and in between them is the foot of that gentleman whisperer as if it seems to me it's here the painter uh, Woodville, Richard Caton Woodville, what the painter is doing is actually alluding to his own role as an artist, as a mediator. He's what brings the past and present together. He's the person who tells the story by which we understand the world we're in. So it really becomes a somewhat self-serving image of the power of the storyteller to shape our understanding of the world, which in this case is the power of the artist who is telling us this story. Hmm. And the power of the, and the newspaper. And the power of the newspaper, absolutely, which was the modern form of communication now. Wow. So as opposed to, just final note then, so as opposed to go back, I mean, if you just think for a moment about kindred spirits, in kindred spirits, power, uh, self-knowledge, uh, access to godhood came through nature. You went outside in this and had this epiphantic experience, this experience of revelation. But in Woodville's painting, it's so much more modern, power comes from the newspaper, from information, from the telegraph. It's like we've moved into an almost pre-digital era. Uh, and it's the person who possesses access to the news who possesses real power. Not access to nature, access to what the telegraph brings us. Wow. It's almost during this time, it's like a feud of, of worldviews. You've got people like the ones pictured in this image who are s obsessed with what's going on in the world and trying to figure it out and reading the newspaper. And then you've got another subset of America who are finding truth outside, away from all of this. I think I read in Walden by Thoreau that he said, I never really read a newspaper that meant anything to me. I don't need, I don't need the post office. Right, right, absolutely, absolutely. I think there's a sense, you know, and we still play with that today. There's a sense of a sort of being distracted, as you were, were saying just a little earlier, by email, by social media, by all these things that are the daily, but where the daily hasn't broken, the ordinary hasn't broken into the extraordinary. And the problem with this sort of the news is it's the ordinary, it's the everyday, and it doesn't reach out into the deeper truths and meanings on the other side of it. Mm. It's interesting. I, um, I had my students read a poem by Walt Whitman called I Sit and Look Out. And uh, the poem is very, you would say, pessimistic about the way that the world is. Walt Whitman's recalling all of these different observations about all the ills in the world, things that are, you know, that are wrong out there that are happening and ne neglected children, abused wives, just all the bad things. And I had my students 
try to think about if you were going to write a I sit and look out poem today, how might you, <laughs> how might you write that poem? And I think, I think there's a great are, assignment. Great assignment. Yeah, it's interesting, right? I think, you know, if I'm thinking about how I might write a poem like that, I could talk about all the things wrong with the world because I know through Twitter and through, you know, uh, if you turn on the news, you could just have a whole list of things that are wrong. Right. But if right. you just, you know, if you're sitting here at school and you're looking out the window and it's a beautiful day and you've got a family to go to Thanksgiving to in a couple of days here, you sit and look out on all these great things, right? It's just two different things different ways of uh, constructing truth in the world, whether through, you know, through the media and through the, what the media tells you or through your own experience of it. Right, right. You know, there, there's a way I, I, I love your, I, I sort of, I love this story, Jake. And um, I think there's a way that you might say sitting here in that room, uh, in, in uh, sitting in the classroom with, all the terrible things happening outside the window and that sense of the classroom as a safe space. Two things to say about that. One is uh, it, it's a safe space that, that allows for what I take to be the, the, the baseline, the basic purpose of education, which is finally, it's a space that allows for critical thinking. It's a space that allows you because you're looking out a window, because you're not actually outside at the moment, to step back and say, what's the story behind the story? What are the questions of power? What are the questions of now race, ethnicity, gender, all these things that float through the world? How do we learn not to simply be taken in by what we hear and see, or how do we learn not to be so absorbed in the present that we forget the larger history that frames it, mm -hmm. but instead to see that history and to see ourselves as actors, sometimes unwillingly, we don't know that we're perpetuating the very systems we're critical of. Mm -hmm. And how do we come to understand that? And that's in that space of the classroom. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Yeah. I think it is a, it's a combination of knowing yourself and understanding yourself and also of understanding the context of the world, studying history, studying great writers, studying some art. Um, it's, it's a blend between those two scopes of uh, reality. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree entirely. So, Professor, um, I'm curious, you, you talked a little bit about how you got into English as a passion. You took that freshman class at Rice and, you know, you fell in love with English. But you didn't say much about where the whole uh, love for art came in. Like, where did you, uh -huh. did you start to really appreciate art and artworks and studying American history through the lens of art? Uh, um. That actually happened. Uh, so when I was a little kid, my mother would occasionally drag me to the local museum to look at, you know, sort of great art. And I thought that was the most boring thing in the world. I really and I was also surprised. Why are all these naked women being displayed on the wall there? That as a little child just sort of was something I couldn't understand. Uh, and then when I was in it wasn't until I was uh, in college. And I just took a standard, uh, I took two art history classes in college, one that was a sort of renaissance to the present survey, Western art history survey, survey course. And the second was a 20th century uh, survey course. Uh, and they just whetted my appetite in a way. They, they suddenly opened up something I hadn't understood before, that a painting could be like a poem that you could dive into it. And I love that experience of the deep dive. Uh, and then when I got to graduate school, uh, I took one or two art, American art actually classes and uh, I was converted again, uh, another conversion experience. And I felt there was something so rich in these paintings that hadn't yet been talked about, that hadn't been touched. Uh, and it just seemed like an opportunity you know, again, take the dive, swim in the ocean of these images and see what meanings you discover there. Hmm. Yeah, I think um, I think 
think that's interesting because I've always loved art and I've loved history and English too. But I think the class that I took with you this summer is the first time that I, that all of those three realms have come together <laughs> for me. And I think, I think looking at the images, looking at the paintings like we did this summer is really helpful as a student because you have something to actually observe on a deep level. And I've really tried to do that in my classes this year. You know, even though it's English, American literature, I think placing paintings at the front of the classroom and getting my students to really observe and sit for 20 minutes looking at all the intricacies of a painting. Right. It's it's yeah. almost a rare experience too to, in today's world because when you look at your phone, you're really just scrolling. Like if something right. captures your attention, maybe you'll watch it for 10 seconds, 15 seconds. Right. It's right. very rare to look at something for an extended period of time and really look at what could this mean? What does this part of the painting signify or represent? And I think that allows them to, to exactly as you said, dive deeper into the nitty gritty details of anything. You know, you could do the same right. thing for a poem. Look at the right. first line and dive into it and observe all you can out of that first line. Yes, absolutely. And I've always felt in a way that I'm not smart enough to know the difference between a poem and a painting. They seem to me to be the same thing, basically. And they all require that same sort of deep dive. Uh, and one other comment that sort of goes back to what you were saying, uh, Jake, is museums sort of, I have this ambivalent, this sort of mixed response to museums. Because on the one hand, they preserve our art. And so I'm eternally grateful for that. But on the other hand, when you take a painting, for example, and you put it on a white wall somewhere and isolate it, what you've done is you've taken it out of history. You've made it simply a special noble artifact, very valuable monetarily and something I should take, you know, I should, I should value. Uh, when actually that work of art is not simply an aesthetic achievement, it's a scream, it's a voice within an historical argument that artists are part of. They participate in the cultural debates of their age. And when we take their art outside that argument and place it on a white wall, we dehistoricize it. We fail to understand the context in which it was created and the way it seems to me it really is a shout, a scream in a larger conversation argument that we call culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think the place to really understand art is in the classroom, and I don't know what the solution to that, that that's, <laughs> that's a conundrum right there, because I know so many people who go to the art museum and say, you know, that was cool, but what did I, what did I see? What did I look at? And I think if they really had the opportunity to dive deeply into even just one of those works of art in an art museum, it's so interesting because right. then you're contextualizing the history with the individuals who are alive at the time and what was the artist. There, there's so much to unpack and study in even one painting. Right, right. And you hope what the classroom allows us to do is exactly that, is to look at the painting and say, oh, this isn't merely a lovely aesthetic artifact. And then you work, go to the next one. But to say, I understand sort of, again, I understand the, the, the moment that this painting is addressing. Mm -hmm. I understand its sort of larger discourse within the world that it's a part of. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's interesting. Yeah. L let, me, um, let me just bring up this painting uh, because this is one that I'm using a lot in my class this year. Uh, this okay. One. So The Voyage of Life by Thomas Cole. And um, this one is Youth. It's called Youth. Right. Um, and I really like this painting. I saw this for the first time yesterday at the National <laughs> Gallery, uh, if I hadn't mentioned that. <laughs> but I really, I really like this one because the palace that's in the background that the young man is setting off towards and leaving the angel figure is very representative to me of the American dream, which we talk a lot about in right. my class, because right. it looks... Right amazing it looks so real and it's compelling this person to, to set off on the journey but it's also 
probably made of clouds and not what you expect it to be <laughs> once you get there. You know, you could debate over whether that that palace is real or not for forever. If the American dream is real or not, you could you could you know create whole arguments about that as many people have. But I think that this painting really encapsulates that central idea of the course. Right. Absolutely. Uh, I, I no, I agree wholeheartedly with your whole sense of it. Uh, and it, it's, it's interesting that, that that palace in the sky, as you're saying, you know, sort of made of clouds, basically, even the architecture is exotic. It's not like a 19th century American building might actually be, mm -hmm. uh, which may be very good because it means we have visionary perspectives. We're trying to create new worlds. But it also may be very ironic in a way of saying, you know, uh, these dreams have no grounding in the real world. And that's the risk, uh, is how to tether it, how to make it real. Um, yeah, and I love I love looking at the figure. Um, let's see if I have a close up of him. Yeah. No, I do from the other Voyage of Life paintings, but the figure is reaching with with one arm right. out, and I love tying this because I teach the Great Gatsby, and at the end of <laughs> Chapter One of the Great Gatsby, he's doing the same the same motion towards the green light and uh, Daisy's dock. And right. I think, I think it really speaks well to a lot of the text that we study in that class. I think that's a great analogy. I think that that's very powerful and it really works. And if you want to play it out more, look at the right arm of each of the three figures in the foreground there. Mm -hmm. Look at the right arm of the angel pointing off to the left. Look at our young man, as you were just talking about, pointing off to the left. And look even at the, uh, the figurehead on the boat. Same thing. They're all that, that sort of gaspies like pointing to the green light. Yeah, pretty interesting. And I love the detail. I was looking closely at the detail of the boat yesterday, and the even the um, uh, the sand in the angel figure on the boat's hands. You can see how, you know, each figure, of, right? Even the grains of sand are so detailed. <laughs> you can see that this painting called "Old Age" or sorry, uh, "Manhood." He's getting towards, you know the midpoint of his life and this, the fine grant grains of the sand are starting to drain away a little bit. He's so right. detailed. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Pretty cool. Well, professor, um, thank you very much for, uh, for spending some time today. I know we didn't get to all of the, <laughs> the paintings, but you know, that, that was a long slideshow. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit and, and dive into some of these, important questions about, uh, you know, about your background and about American history and art. So I have to thank you, Jake, for sort of this wonderful opportunity. It's just, it's great to be able to talk with you. It's great to be able to sort of share a sort of, uh, just to share our common love for these images, these objects, this culture, this history in all its complications. I agree. And I have to say, I've, uh, I've really, you know, I, I said this earlier, but I really have taken a lot from your class and, and used it with my high school students this year um, because I think the combination of, of art and history and humanities really works well. It creates a, you know, a very stimulating room. You know, if you're not really into the, the Walden by Thoreau and you, don't, you can't really picture it or understand it, now you have a painting by Cole to help you understand right. the time frame and what's going on and what people were thinking about in the mid 1800s. Um, you know, you're learning my students take American history at the same time that they're taking American literature. So they're learning all these things at the same time, which I think it, it's like a 3d experience. Absolutely. That's a, that's a wonderful description. The, the 3d experience, because it's very artificial when you say, well, here's the literature over here. That's different from, because that's in an English department. That's different from the art over here because that's in an art department. And it's like, what we need are these sort of, uh, these cross, uh, cross disciplinary dialogues because they're all being created at the same time, at the same historical moment. Um, and we need to understand the, the conversation that's going on. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Professor, let me ask you one more question. So, sure. so usually uh, on these episodes, I ask someone to bring a book recommendation that they would uh -huh. that they would recommend for anyone viewing or anything that you've really read recently. You know what you're reading now, what you've read recently, or just in your life that has made an impact on you the most. I'm going to go way outside anything we've been talking about. Okay? That's okay. Uh, and I'm going to go to a graphic novel. I'm going to go back to, that's been around now for, I don't know, 20 years or so, but to Art Spiegelman's Mouse, M-A-U-S. Hmm. Uh, I found that uh, it's, it's a sort of two volume graphic novel. It's based on Spiegelman's interviews with his father, who is a Holocaust survivor. Uh, and it's also about the entangled relationships of a son with his very difficult father. At the same time as it's about this larger historical moment uh, that we're still in the aftermath of. Uh, and I found it extraordinarily powerful and moving. And the illustrations are just what you were talking about. You go to the slightest detail and you discover this wasn't accidental. Something really interesting mm -hmm. is happening here. So I would recommend, uh, if you haven't read, pick up Mouse, especially the first volume of it, but both volumes. Uh, I always see Mouse around and I've never I've never picked it up. But, but it's one of those books that I think you see, you know, it invokes curiosity because right. M A U S. You've got the little mouse on there. I've, I definitely know exactly what you're talking about. I just have n I didn't know what it was about. So thank you. Yes, yes, right. Yeah. If you get a chance to read it, get back to me. I'd love to hear your response. And I like how you chose something that that has the art and the drawings in there with the text. I think that's pretty fitting. Right. <laughs> thank you. You caught me where I live. <laughs> Well, Professor, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Let's, let's do this again soon or at least chat soon. And uh, I hope you have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you. Same to you, Jake. And thank you for the honor and the opportunity to do this. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay. All right. We'll Bye -bye. see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.